The Archangel Chronicles Chapter 18 Bartatua Copyright 2023 by Raymond Kaladi You say you're fine But I can see right through You're holding your secrets for way too long This can't keep going on With every lie They keep on hurting you Getting away with everything they do This can't keep going on We're gonna find them And I'm gonna fight for you They better start hiding We'll be running with the lions, lions We'll be running with the lions, lions furthest, most remote outpost of the Eastern Empire. It sat on a peninsula jutting out into the cyan-colored waters of the Caspian Sea. We had stayed there for three days. It was the last place on the eastern edge of this ancient world where Augustus Caesar's safe conduct orders and medallions would be honored. Baku was part of the Roman vassal client kingdom of Caucasian Albania. While the safe conduct passes and letters from Honorius were respected by the king and his forces, it took quite a lot of persuasion with the local authorities to let us pass. Persuasion in this neck of the Roman woods was another name for outright bribery. It had become impossible for us to keep our presence hidden, or the fact that there were valuable cargoes of treasure in the slow, lumbering wagon loads being escorted by a warband of Scythian horse archers and their queen, making slow progress through their mountainous homeland. Once known the vulture instincts of every local functionary was stimulated to the highest level. They exacted a toll here, a fee there, a tax here, and an outright highway robbery when they could get away with it. Theron was beside himself. At the rate I have to dole out silver to these thieves, we'll have none left by the time we get to the Masajite homelands, he said. Axia was curiously detached and dismissive about the expenditures. We do not concern ourselves with these payments, dear Theron. We will just take more treasure when the time is ripe. 
It is the way of the steps. I'd like to take a few denarii from these scoundrels, I tell you, thundered Theron. I'd like to hang them upside down by their ankles and empty all the coin from their pockets. We must not upset our hosts for now, but we will remember them, said Axia with a dismissive wave of her hand. The three days in Baku were fruitful in terms of our preparations. Skyrus and Theron were able to commandeer what we needed from the local markets and harbor through threats, intimidation, and more bribery. At length, we had accomplished all we needed to continue. On the fourth day, we left Baku behind us and followed a path along the shores of the Caspian Sea headed north. After several days on that road, we approached the gates of Alexander and a fortress located there where we found the third cohort of Legio XII Fulminata garrisoning the fort. Scarus knew their primus Pilus, a tall fair-haired Gaul named Sabinius. They greeted each other heartily with much backslapping and ribald joking after drinking a few toasts in the prefectory. Scarus settled down to business. Sabinius, old friend that ye be, tell us about the frontier past these here gates. By Mars, Scarus, you don't actually intend to take these wagons out beyond, do you? You'd be picked clean by raiders before you made five leagues. Well now, old friend, tis our plan to drive these wagons north, you know. What's in them? Rumor has it that they're loaded with gold and silver. Aye, rumors be rumors, and yet best be holding your tongue about them, me friend. Truth be told, it's none of your business what we be carrying, said Scarus, rubbing his beard. Rumor also has it that you escort a Scythian queen. That's trouble too, if it's so. That rumor, Centurion, should as well remain unrepeated, I said. You have seen from our credentials that we are here on a state mission. You would do well to forget that we ever passed through these gates. Sabinius looked at me and then back to Scarus. What have you got yourself mixed up in, eh? He said. Well, let me give you some advice. These gates here, this fortress, was built by Alexander of Macedon himself over 300 years ago to keep them Scythians out of our civilized lands. The fact is, they live by marauding and stealing, except when they form alliances with other thieving barbarians. They're pirates, all of them. And that probably goes for your queen as well. And that fact hasn't changed in 300 years. Sabinius looked carefully at me. And where is this Scythian queen I heard about? Why isn't she here? And where is their company of horse warriors that I've heard so much about from my scouts? Hmm, indisposed at the moment. But on the morrow... I'm sure she will make a grand spectacle of passing through the gates with her treasure, guarded by her gladiators, whether you like it or not. Sabinius put his hands up in a gesture of surrender. Well, I've tried to warn you, but you have a long, long journey around that sea, at least 150 leagues, with those carts laden with whatever it is that you're carrying. You won't make five leagues a day if you're lucky. And then there are the Sarmatians, like the Roxolani to worry about. They'll sweep down upon your caravan from the hills. They'll pick you off like flies in a cesspool. Those gladiators you have with you won't last a week. And your Scythian warband, I think I've only counted eight or 10 of them. They'll be overwhelmed even if they fight like demons. Whatever mission you're on, my friend, it's a fool's errand, and your head will be added to the local chieftain's collection. The next day dawned sunny and bright, with a flawless blue sky. Our procession approached 
the gates of Alexander, which were obligingly thrown wide open for the occasion. Sabinius had drawn up his cohort, dressed in their parade best, standing in a long double line, facing each other and at attention. Kettle drums beat apace, and the cohort's trumpeters blasted a fanfare as Axia Panoplius, she who is worthy of armor, rode out the, at the head of the procession, followed by her twelve priestesses riding on white horses. She was immediately followed, curiously, by only ten Scythian warriors. Her brothers and the rest of the war band were nowhere to be seen. Next followed the slow moving treasure wagons, flanked by Theron's mounted gladiators, dressed in black cloaks and mail, about two score of them. Scarus, Abu, and I rode at the back of the procession. The further we went from the gates and the fortress, the greater my anxiety grew. We had stepped through the last portal of civilization. In the distance behind us, an order was barked out and the massive gates closed with a resounding clang. We proceeded down the road and after another bend or two, the fortress could be seen no more. We had passed into another world of vast plains beside the shiny cyan waters of the Caspian Sea to our right and the vast rolling green hills descending to the plains on our left. Three days we traveled. Not a soul was to be seen anywhere. We were alone in a vast, unfamiliar place. At the evening of the third day, we camped by the sea. The waxing three-quarter moon rose in the east after sunset, casting its silvery glow over the vast horizons of sea and sky. The wave tops sparkled like diamonds in the ghostly light. I sat by the campfire with Abu, who was sound asleep after the day's ride. Scarus was standing up, his hawk eyes never resting, looking for shapes moving in the distant moonlight. He slowly walked around the campfire, never relaxing, ever vigilant. Nevertheless, it was a remarkably peaceful vista. Axia came out from her tent and looked at Abu cradled in my lap. She sat down beside me. Her priestesses remained in her tent, softly chanting. Do you always let your slaves sleep so soundly, physician? Why do you let them rest before you yourself will rest? She asked. Vasilisa, I said. He's not my slave, nor even my servant, though he is content now to think that he is. I own no man, woman, or child. The boy was given to me by fate to watch over him. I looked down at Abu's face, soft in the moonlight, and innocent in his sleep. I do not have children, but he is like a son to me, I think. Axia nodded. Well, if he is to be your son, he should learn the ways. He has taken well to the saddle. We would make a warrior of him yet. Warrior, I said. Is that the highest he could rise to in your lands? Axia laughed gently. We have left your land of cities and fields and markets, physician. There, everyone has a place. There is order, rank, and people do what is expected of them. Here, she breathed in the night air deeply and exhaled. Here, it is different. We are free to become what we must become. It is expected that he will learn what he must be. He is not far from the time where he will have to leave the band and seek out his spirit. 
He has to find his guide, who will be sent to him by the Creator. And what about me, Vasilisa? Am I to be your slave? Axia's eyes flashed. She grabbed my wrist and squeezed it hard. I told you, physician. I have come through curtains of fire and ice to find you. Tabitha, the goddess of fire, has ordained it. You shall be my mate. You shall be my shaman. Together, we shall rule the host and take back my motherland. This is your fate. Surely you must see this. Vasilisa, these are commands. You command me to become your husband. But I cannot be bound to you by mere commands in matters of the heart. I have pledged my love to another. I think you know this. Axia huffed. Ha! That woman! What is she to you? She has no power. She commands no warriors. She cannot loose an arrow or ride a horse in battle. She is not worthy of you. My Vasilisa, it is I who am not worthy of her. She was quiet for a moment. She touched my shoulder and spoke softly. But you have power. You have knowledge. You have courage and you do not shrink from danger. I have seen this, and I must have you with me, with me to death and then beyond death. I turned, locking eyes with hers. Is it power, domination that you must have? Must you sacrifice your happiness for revenge? What happens when you obtain that revenge? Will drinking from the skull of our taxis make you whole? What will you do then? Axius stiffened. You have never seen your father and kin slaughtered like cattle before your eyes. You have never been betrayed by your flesh and blood. You have never been thrown out into the cold, pursued by your enemies, hunted like a dog in the wilderness. You have never been hungry or cold. When you have suffered all of these things and more, then you may speak to me of love and happiness. I have a fire within me, and I must quench it. Then can I rest at peace in my father's Kagan. Do you not speak to me of healing or love or happiness. These things will only make us weak. There was a long silence between us after she said this. At last, she sighed. She came closer, looked into my eyes, and softly stroked my face with her hand. Do you not find me attractive, physician? Not even a little? I reached out and gathered her hands into mine. Alas, my Vasilisa, you are beautiful beyond description. You are a force of nature like the wind, but you are also like a flame, and I am like a moth. You will consume me. Axia came closer. Then, my little moth, let my breath blow you away from the flame so that you will not be burned. The spell between us was broken by footsteps. We turned to see Skyrus out of breath. They're gone, he said. Who, I said. Theron's cut throats, of course, came his reply. We spent an anxious night, huddled together in a circle around Axia and Abu and the twelve priestesses, facing outwards into the dark. A dozen of Axia's war band, swords drawn, Scarus and I. We were unable to draw the wagons around us in a defensive ring, because during the night, the draft horses had been let loose and were gone. We were stuck now, unable to move forward without the treasure wagons. At dawn, our pursuers came, a 
about a hundred mounted warriors and the gladiators. Prominent among Theron's hired thugs was Thraxus leading the way. When I see that Theron again, remind me to wring his neck, Scarus said under his breath. Ah, Scarus, my friend and protector, they've missed their chance, I said. Now the game begins. Give me a sword and shield and show me how to fight. Scarus laughed loudly. No sword for ye, Dominus, sir, but a shield and a lance be your weapons of choice, he said as he presented them to me. Easier for ye. Just poke them, them horses in the face with that. I'll be doing the rest. Scarus raised his legionary shield, the scotum, and held a javelin in his shield hand. Inside the shield were another dozen smaller darts for throwing, attached to the inner rim. He held another Roman throwing javelin, a pilum in his right hand. He looked at me, smiling, eyes flashing. You'll have your fill of bodies to heal in an hour, I'll wager, he grunted. Thraxus and his raiders were in no hurry. That was good. He no doubt thought that there was no way out for us. But it was time to delay him even further. I stepped forward to engage him in conversation. He came to me, mounted on his horse, and looked down. He raised his lance and prodded my shield. Now, what do we have here? A court jester, armed with his toy shield and spear? Come now and play with me, he laughed contemptuously, and looking down at our circle of warriors surrounding the queen, he spat. And here, at last, is one of the treasures we came for. The Scythian queen of the Massagite herself. He cocked his head. I heard you are quite the charioteer, my queen. Perhaps you'll run your last race for me, he sneered. He looked over to Scarus. Ah, here at last is someone I know. Remember me, Scarus? Twas a long time ago, remember? Spain, Cantabria. Scarus hissed. I, I remember too well, coward be ye. Ye left your post, men died. I should have skewered ye right then and there. Mm, but the fates are cruel, aren't they, my friend? Because of you, I was sold into slavery and then trained for the arena. Every day I lived, I swore revenge should I ever run across your path. I prayed to the gods to send you my way. Every time I stayed or slayed another in the arena, it was you I killed in my mind. But then one day, Fortuna came my way. That fat Greek Theron came looking to hire some of us to guard the treasure. Where is that fat bastard now? Thraxus looked around our small band of warriors. Axia raised her head and spoke. He's gone from my service. We waste time, Thraxus. Name your terms. Let us make a deal and see that you depart. We have gold and silver, she pointed to the wagons. Take half and be gone. Thraxus laughed. Half? <laughs> Why, my queen, we shall have it all. He gestured to the small circle of warriors. You are too few, and we are many. Your men will die. Your priestesses will be divided amongst my men for entertainment. And I will take you to someone who will pay even more than all of the treasure in these wagons. Your uncle is waiting for you. Our taxes, said Axia. So he's behind all of this. Thraxus shook his massive head. No, my queen. I was after the treasure in these wagons at first, but then I learned who you were and where you were going. I reached out to a few friends who knew other friends. You, 
are my bonus. Your uncle offered me a bounty for you, dead or alive. I couldn't pass that up. Thraxus paused to let the thought think in. But now that I see you up close, I am tempted to forego that bounty. I think I may take you for myself. What a trophy you will make. We will parade you around all the circuses in the Empire as my plaything. I gazed into the distance, and then I saw what I needed to see. Thraxus, my friend, I shouted loudly and stepped forward to attract his attention, and so all his men could hear me. It seems you have things a little backwards. You've come all this way for nothing. You see, my treacherous friend, the fact is that there is no treasure in those carts. You have led the, your men to this place, a place of death, to capture a few cartloads of useless stones. Thraxus looked at me, his eyes narrowed. You lie, physician. He made a gesture to one of his lieutenants, who dismounted, climbed up to one of the carts, and with a knife in hand slifed over the canvas coverings, revealing nothing but a load of smooth stones underneath. Thraxus's other men now leapt off their horses and swarmed the carts, cutting open the coverings and revealing nothing but stones. They began swearing and drawing their weapons, leaping off the carts and approaching us menacingly. Thraxus cursed loudly and again raised his lance. Wait, wait, I shouted. Before you run me through, there is one more thing that you must hear. I shouted again so all his men could hear. Dear Thraxus, I am sorry that your men were cheated out of their gold and silver, but after all, I am a magician, and I simply made it disappear and turned the gold and silver into stones. But I think there's still a deal to be made, and the deal is this. Leave us now, go your way, and you will be spared. Thraxus cursed again, and thrusting his lance forward and spurring his horse, hit my shield. The lance penetrated through it, miss, just missing my shoulder. I threw it aside and jumped to the right and raised my lance, remembering Scarus's advice. But before I could act, I heard a familiar whirring, whooshing sound behind me. Abu had crept into the circle and stood beside Axia. He let loose with his sling, and the lead bullet within it shot across the short distance and struck Thraxus with the velocity of a musket ball in between the eyes, just below the rim of his helmet. He fell backwards over the rear of his horse, crashing down like a giant tree and landed with a heavy thud on his back, lifeless. Now pandemonium and confusion descended over the field. Thraxus's men stood still, unable to process what had just happened, astounded at the sight of their leader dead on the ground, felled by a mere boy. Scarus leapt forward and unleashed two of his javelins in quick succession, each finding its mark, felling two more gladiators. Without stopping, he threw the other darts attached to the inner surface of his shield in rapid succession. More bodies fell, screaming in agony, as Scarus now leapt forward, shield up, and sword drawn. From behind Thraxus, now came loud war cries and whoops from a mass of voices and the pounding hoofbeats of a host of mounted horse warriors. Here were our rescuers at last, the red Scythian warriors and other heavily armed lancers that I did not recognize. They swept into the camp and around the wagons, unleashing a torrent of arrows on the hapless raiders who had, in sudden terror, clumped together in a group holding their shields up. A dozen or more of them fell during the first volley. The rest, overcome with fear and terror, now threw away their weapons and knelt down, with their hands held up in a gesture of surrender. 
Baxia came forth, held up her arms, and shouted to the horse warriors. Suddenly, they stopped circling around the remaining group of gladiators and raiders and sheathed their bows and battle axes. Axia seized my spear and held it aloft lengthways over her head. Bartatua, she shouted rhythmically, pumping the spear in union with, unison with the chant. Then the cry was taken up by the host. Bartatua, 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 replied a thousand voices in unison. The cries and chanting went on and on. Now the ranks of the mounted warriors parted. Axia's two brothers burst through to the front, and in one easy and effortless motion, jumped off their horses, holding their spears aloft sideways over their heads, shaking them and taking up the chant, Bartatua. Axia stepped forward and greeted her brothers, who bowed deeply to her. They embraced Axia and then raised her onto their shoulders. They processed through the host, who swarmed around her, repeating again and again the cry, Barta Tua, and clashing their short spears against their shields. Axia was brought over to one of the treasure wagons, now filled with stones. She held up her arms for all to see. The chanting stopped, and the host became silent. Brothers and sisters, warriors of Tabiti, the eternal fire, I greet you. Hearken to what I have to say. This day your queen has been delivered back into the lands of the endless sky. This day I, your true queen, have returned to you. Another raucous round of the cry, Barta Tua, with the clanging shields and the stomping of feet, erupted in response. Axia raised her arms again. Our treasure is safe. These fools sought to take it from us. They sought to deliver me to the hands of our taxis, but they have been tricked, for I have brought with me a great shaman, a magician from the West, and he has turned our treasure into these stones. Axia reached down and scooped up handfuls of the smooth stones and let them drop for all to see. Brothers and sisters, warriors all, I tell you that our treasure is safe, for it has been sent across this great sea and waits for us in a secure place in the land of our fathers and mothers, waiting for us to march here with our host, gathering friends and allies as we go. Then shall our taxis, the usurper, see our might. That day I shall cut off his head and drink from his skull. Bartatua, my father, will be avenged. Another ferocious chorus of Barta Tua erupted from the host, repeated again and again. I felt myself seized by strong hands. Before I knew it, they were hoisting me atop the shoulders of Prothesis and Skumaxa, along with Abu, and took me over to the cart where Axia stood. Axia gestured towards me. See, my brothers and sisters, here is my shaman, my healer, my magician, Adamus the Wise, he who can turn gold and silver into stones and make the treasures reappear. He has come to help us again to regain our lands and throw out the usurper. Now a chorus of Adam, Adam, Adam erupted from the host. I didn't know what else to do. I simply waved to the crowd and bowed like a rock star. My little moth, fear not. You have done well. You shall fly with me to great heights. She sees my hands. You must help me bring light to my people. She said this with tears in her eyes. And I saw that Axia was alone and vulnerable. I could not abandon her. Music for Chapter 18, Epidemic Sound, Running with the Lions, by Loving Caliber. 
Epidemic Sound, A March Across Ancient Land by John Abbott. Epidemic Sound, Our Final Mission by Christopher Moe Ditlevson. Epidemic Sound to Valhalla by John Abbott. Epidemic Sound, The Last March of Heroes by Grant Newman. Ed Records, Iron Dust. Alexander Vazanin, Danger. Ben Sound, Evolution. Twins Music, Rise. Ed Records, Legends. Archangel Chronicles, Copyright 2023 by Raymond Collati, All Rights Reserved.